Light, Candle Lit Vigil, India sees solemn demonstrations in remembrance of the rape and murder victim as the medical community demands for systematic change. A call for peace, Pope Francis and Indonesia's grand imam call for unity and sign declaration against religious violence for the sake of humanity. Kremlin concerns. The Biden administration accuses Russia of sprawling election interference campaigns and sees fake news sites designed to spread Russian propaganda. And comfort creatures. Healing education and leisure are abundant at the charity in Tennessee, which provides equine therapy for individuals with disabilities. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. With the latest updates around the world for this Thursday, I'm Amasha Fernando. And we start off the bulletin with more information on the protests in India. A candlelight visual and protest took over the streets in Kolkata as thousands joined the demand for justice in the case of a trainee doctor who was raped and murdered at Arjrika Medical College. Throughout various areas in Kolkata, participants used flashlights, cand candles and torches to express their solidarity during a large-scale demonstration responding to the tragic event. Modi highlighted that Singapore is a leading economic partner for India with nearly $160 billion of investment in the Indian economy. The trip is crucial for India as it will give a major boost to India's Act East policy which was announced in 2014 as a diplomatic initiative to promote economic, strategic and cultural relations with countries in the Asia-Pacific region. The in-depth discussion held between Modi and Wong wasn't just confined to strengthening economic cooperation. The two talked about cultural ties between the two countries. Modi announced that India's first Thiruvalluvar Cultural Centre would be opened in Singapore. Moreover, regional and global issues of mutual interest including India-ASEAN relations and India's vision for the Indo-Pacific were part of discussions between the leaders. And on diplomatic updates now, India and Singapore signed a Memorandum of Understanding for cooperation on semiconductors, digital technologies, skill development and the health care during Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to the city-state. Doctors nationwide have protested since the August 9th incident involving the 31-year-old trainee doctor at the Kolkata Hospital, prompting renewed calls for stricter women's safety laws in India. India's federal police said it had arrested the former principal of R.G. Carr Medical College in Kolkata for alleged graft. The Central Bureau of Investigation said Sandeep Ghosh, who resigned as principal of the British colonial era college days after the incident became public, was arrested on charges of financial irregularities. The CBI said it also arrested two vendors of hospital supplies and a close aide of Ghosh in connection with the case. Although tougher laws were introduced after the 2012 gruesome gang rape and murder of a 23-year-old student on a moving bus in New Delhi, activists say the incident in Kolkata has highlighted how women in India continue to suffer from sexual violence. Over in Indonesia, Pope Francis and Nasruddin Umar, the Grand Imam of Jakarta's Istiqlal Mosque, have signed a joint declaration calling for interfaith friendship, stating that they're talking a stand against religious violence and urging unified action to protect the planet. Pope Francis has warned against using religion to fuel conflict on the last day of his visit to Indonesia. At the Istiqlal Mosque in the capital Jakarta, the Pope signed a declaration on religious harmony and environmental protection with the mosque's grand imam and met with the local leaders of six religions. Speaking at the mosque, the Pope said that humanity is facing a serious crisis brought about by war, conflict and the destruction of the environment. The Pope also visited a tunnel that connects Istiqlal Mosque to a Catholic cathedral across the strait. He and the Grand Imam stood at the entrance to the Tunnel of Friendship, which he said was an eloquent sign of how people of different beliefs could share roots. The latest on the MPOX outbreak now, the African Union's health watchdog said 
the first delivery of almost 100,000 doses of Mpox vaccines will arrive in the Democratic Republic of Congo today. A total of 200,000 jabs are expected this week. The vast Central African country of around 100 million people is, at, is an epicenter of the Mpox outbreak, with cases of death rising. It's an announcement that will come as a relief for many living in the DRC, which has seen a surge in Mpox cases, as well as further afield. On Friday, the Director General of the WHO said that vaccines against the disease would soon arrive in the country. On the vaccines, um, some of the vaccines will arrive in the next few days in the DRC. He added that he believes that the outbreaks in Africa can be stopped in the next six months. According to another WHO official, tens of thousands of doses, including some donated by Danish drug maker Bavarian Nordic, are ready to be dispatched. Earlier in August, the organisation declared the disease a global public health emergency after an outbreak in the DRC that spread to nearby countries, including Burundi. This year, more than 18,000 suspected cases have been recorded in the DRC, with more than 600 deaths, sparking concern among residents. Mpox has been identified in Africa since 2022, but the current outbreak has seen a surge in cases caused by clade 1A and 1B, which are more serious strains. Cases of the disease have also been reported beyond the African continent, including in Sweden, where a case was detected earlier this month. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And on road to the White House now, the U.S. has charged and sanctioned Russian state media executives and restricted Kremlin-linked broadcasters as it accused Moscow of a widespread campaign to interfere with the presidential election. Tonight, the Attorney General warning the American people that Russia's efforts to interfere in this year's U.S. presidential election is intensifying. The Biden administration announcing new sanctions and charges alleging that senior aides to Vladimir Putin are engaged in a sweeping operation aimed at supplying millions of Americans with this information. The government seized 32 bogus website domains purchased by Russian security services that mirror legitimate news sites, creating fake stories and using authentic looking logos as part of a campaign called Doppelganger. For example, this looks like a story from the Washington Post about Ukraine, but it isn't. And also today, DOJ bringing charges against two employees of RT, also known as Russia Today, alleging the state-controlled media company funded by Russia is still at it after being forced out of the U.S. in 2022. The FBI saying it uncovered a scheme involving nearly $10 million laundered through a network of foreign shell entities to covertly fund a Tennessee media firm. That company posting nearly 2,000 videos on social media that have garnered more than 16 million views on YouTube alone. And the political updates in Canada now. The country's left-wing New Democratic Party pulled support for a two-and-a-half-year-old agreement with Justin Trudeau's Liberals that had helped his, his minority government in power. In a video posted to social media, NDP leaders Jagmeet Singh said he has informed the Prime Minister of his decision, saying the Liberals were too weak and too selfish to fight for Canadians. That means Trudeau will be forced to strike new alliances to keep governing. He dismissed talks of an early election, vowing to stay on and continue pushing through social programs. Under the 2022 deal, the NDP agreed to keep Trudeau in power until mid-2025, in return for more social spending. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh accused the Prime Minister of not being able to take on the opposition Conservatives. <laughs> Trudeau first took office in November 2015. Polls suggest he is suffering from voter fatigue, with the Conservatives forecasted to easily win an upcoming election. Canadians must head to the polls by the end of October 2025. 
In a marathon session, Mexico's lower house of Congress approved a controversial judicial reform, a crucial step towards cementing a key ambition of outgoing President Andres Manuel Rope Obrado, setting the tone for the next administration. Mexico's lower house of Congress approved a controversial judicial reform on Wednesday after a marathon session that lasted more than 12 hours. It paves the way for the bill to go to the Senate, where it is expected to be approved due to the ruling Morena party's strong majority. Judicial workers and students protested the vote outside of Congress, forcing lawmakers into a nearby gym. The debate began on Tuesday afternoon, passing Wednesday morning with 359 votes in favor and 135 votes against. Opponents criticized the single session debate and passage as a rush job, saying more time should have been taken. The backbone of the constitutional reform calls for the election by popular vote of more than 7,000 judges and magistrates, including the Supreme Court. The number of Supreme Court judges would also be reduced to nine from 11, and their terms limited to 12 years. Work experience needed to qualify for ministerial positions would be cut in half. President-elect Claudia Sheinbaum is also in support. Blazing for two days, a massive wildfire has destroyed 20% of a Brazilian forest which the officials suspect may have been started by the arsonists. Firefighter Godoy has been putting out the flames. The National Forest of Brasilia protects vital springs that provide 70% of the city's fresh water and is a conservation area that spans more than 21 square miles of woodland. The fire ignited during the dry season, allowing it to spread rapidly. Firefighters struggled to contain it before it could spread to nearby orchards where farmers grow tomatoes and flowers, despite strong winds complicating their efforts. The forest size was almost halved in 2022 to give way to urban development under former far-right President Jair Bolsonaro, who reduced environmental controls and allowed deforestation to surge in the Amazon rainforest. This year, a record drought in the El Nino weather pattern have heightened fire risks in the Amazon, with August seeing the most fires since 2010. From cladding firms to government, inquiry report on the 2017 London fire outlines roles of those involved in the ill-fated incident. The inquiry report blames government failure and dishonesty of companies and features a cast of authorities and people who were involved in the disastrous refurbishment. Seven years after the disaster that shook England, a long-awaited final report has been released by the Grenfell Tower Inquiry. 72 people died when fire ripped through the 23-story public housing residence in one of the richest areas of West London. The report determined blame lies with the government, construction industry, and most of all, the companies that installed flammable panels called cladding on the outside of the building. An electrical fault in a refrigerator on the fourth floor started the fire. Flames spread uncontrollably, fueled by the flammable exterior cladding. Harrowing accounts from inside the building led to fury over building standards and the treatment of low-income communities. While Wednesday's 1,700-page report offers insight into how the blaze happened, survivors and victims' families want justice. Today, more than 3,000 buildings in Britain standing five stories or higher still have unsafe cladding, and work to fix them has yet to start on more than two-thirds of them. And finally tonight, there is hope in found family always. And this rings true for a certain charity in Franklin, Tennessee, which offers healing experiences for individuals with disabilities, with horses who were also formerly abused. At Saddle Up in Franklin, Tennessee, that is both a command and a way of life. Saddle Up's mission is to provide therapeutic, educational and recreational experiences with horses for people with disabilities. The director of operations told WTBF some of the horses come with their own challenges. According to Wood, that just adds some equine empathy towards their human riders. Bishop is Saddle Up's largest horse. Kids say he's calm and gentle. He's also blind in one eye. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. 
Stay tuned as Sanavi Mudan Nayaka will join you next with the nightly business report. Thank you for watching and have a good night.